guys are smart, we'll give you the advance information to help make sense of this. Um, where's Tom? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he ninja it off. Right, so, um, Wait, okay, fine. Uh, we'll go over it again and again. So let's build a brain. Pretend that you're a barnacle. Okay, and you've got your feathers out, waving in the current, and some fish comes by. What do you do? You retract. You freeze and retract. Mm -hmm. And we still have a vestige of this in our nervous system. It's called the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is what goes down into your gut and gives you that tightening withdrawal, that freeze feeling. So that freeze and withdrawal is caused by the vagus nerve. And it's down low in the, uh, in the lower part of the brain stem. So the dorsal vagus nerve in particular is that freeze and withdraw. In fact, the word angst means to tighten, to throttle, to squeeze. And uh, that vagus nerve goes down into our gut and our heart, and that's where people feel it. And they feel it as a lump in their throat. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the word anger is related to angst, to tighten. So that's the dorsal vagus nerve. Um, now, then a little bit farther up, we have uh, the centers which regulate heartbeat, um, the digestion, respiration. And then the reptiles came along, and they developed the basal ganglia. And the basal ganglia helped the reptile to do repetitious movements, like walking. And those repetitious movements are still part of us. We still have the basal ganglia. So when we learn something, at first we start out practicing it in the cortex. And as it becomes a routine, it becomes embedded in the basal ganglia as habit. Now, mammals then develop the limbic system, which enables us to play, to socialize. It also gives us fear and anger. And then primates developed the, the neocortex, and in particular in humans, the frontal lobes, which is where we think about things. And so the basic perspective of the self is that we're in this hollow ball of the brain, shining our light of consciousness around, becoming aware of whatever sensations and ideas are rippling across the surface. Okay. So it's again a hollow ball on a stick, and we've got that several sources of light and ripples spread out across the cortex. So as these sensations ripple out, they become perceptions, and as desires ripple out, they become the ideas, plans, and fantasies. And we have this interaction between different desires that we experience as that internal dialogue of thought. Now, so as those ripples spread out, one idea gets hooked to another, and it becomes a thought. Now, the word mind and the word mend are cousins, as is memory and mental. If I mend something, I stick it together. If I remember something, I put a series of events together. So mind and mental are related to the same idea of putting things together. Now, this is a movie strip. It's one picture after another, which in a train of thought would be one idea after another. And in fact, the word idea uh, means little picture. So this is what the brain waves look like. The raw brain wave is up top here. And when we break it down into different frequencies, we can see these spindles of activity. And these spindles of activity represent different film clips going on in the brain. So it's as if I'm inside my brain looking out through the window of sensation and perception. And then I've got all these movies going on that I could tune into. In fact, there's too many of them for me to tune into. So there's the raw brain wave, and when we break it out and, and we filter it, so you can see basically these spindles of activity 
which represent different trains of thought that peak up and die down. Looking at brain waves in real time. So you can see just how fast these things are actually happening, which is rather remarkable to think about clumps of nerve cells producing the, all of this activity. And again, these spindles of activity are related to these trains of thought that rise and fall. And if we separate it out by frequency, we can see these different humps, which represent different movies that are all taking place at the same time. With the lower frequencies to the left and the higher frequencies to the right, you can see all of these different ideas that the person could tune into. So they're only tuning into one train of thought at a time, and all the rest of it is the pre-conscious. The unconscious is the stuff they don't want to look at. We can reconstruct from brainwave activity what a person is looking at. So on the left is what we present to the individual, and then on the right is what we reconstruct from measuring brain waves on the surface of the skull. When we show people this movie, we can reconstruct these images from the cortical activity. We can actually spy on what's going on in that person's mind. And you can see that we only get a blurry picture. But still, that's pretty darn good, actually. It's when it's highly activated, one of these trains of thought can draw us in. So here we are, we have the outside world. And when there's a very intense train of thought, it can draw us in and influence our perception of surrounding events. For example, kids watched a scary movie. Mom turns out the light, tucks them into bed, and doesn't realize, oh, I forgot to close the closet door. What happens? <laughs> the, 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 the train of thought about monsters starts to manifest in the clothes hanging in the closet. Kid cries out, loses it, gets drawn in, oh, there's monsters. And then mom says, oh, yeah, OK, great. She turns on the light. Monsters instantly vanish. She closes the closet door, turns on the night light. It's OK. Maybe. <laughs> All right. So this hijack mechanism is not just about addiction. It's about all kinds of thoughts and ideas. So true or false, disinhibited people are fun to be around. Mm. Sure, just ask any nurse or police <laughs> officer about when people lose their cool. So the frontal lobes help people keep their cool by inhibiting some of those animalistic impulses. There's a balance between the frontal lobes and the brain stem. The brain stem does the go, go, run, fight, or dance. The frontal lobes do the pause and plan. And there's usually a balance, just like that teeter-totter I showed you with our squirrel. When the brain stem takes over, we get in touch with our inner toddler. And what's interesting is that, yeah, people don't like to lose it, and so they will often feel compelled to use their substance to prevent losing control of themselves. Just like little kids afraid of spiders. They see a piece of fuzz on the floor. They think, ah, oh, spider! Dad realizes, that's eh, a piece of lint. He picks it up, and here, it's a piece of lint. Kid won't even look at it because they're more afraid of that loss of control, that loss of self, than they are of the spider. So again, we have the uh, frontal lobe where we think about things. We've got the amygdala down here that sends surges of adrenaline to the frontal lobe, and that suppresses frontal lobe activity. And we've got the reward activation system that sends surges of dopamine, which suppress frontal lobe activity. We also have an approach and avoid system, which it turns out that the right frontal lobe is the avoid channel, and the left is the opportunity channel. So doom channel, opportunity channel. So approach is the left, avoid is the right. So and people that get depression, they have developed an internal posture of tuning into the doom channel and getting people into the habit of tuning into the opportunity channel helps to suppress the doom channel. So a whole lot of what we're doing is we're training people to shut down 
the doom by tuning into the opportunity. Dr. Davidson down at the UW has found that when you train people to do mindfulness meditation, you can actually measure an increase in the fibers between the left frontal lobe and the amygdala as people become better and better at shutting down those things that they want to avoid. People that are more optimistic mm -hmm. by nature, mm -hmm. or, okay, or perhaps but not by uh, experience early in life or mm -hmm. trauma or whatever, um, how does that is it, you're talking about the, the right. fiber connections between, right. between the two lobes to the amygdala or other? Uh, right, between the frontal lobe and the amygdala. And in fact, if we look at uh, the brain waves, normal people will have more alpha waves on the right because the doom channel is in idle mode. So you've got more alpha waves when the brain is idling because they're tuned into opportunity. People with endogenous depression, it's the opposite. They have more alpha waves on the left because they're tuned into the doom channel. Just by teaching people to press the alpha waves on the left, we can help them with their depression. So that's why really any meditation system is helpful. Absolutely. And then this, that endorphins will, uh, arise from the same system that uh, regulates the production of cortisol. Okay. How do, which, this one? Yes. Pro-opio melanocortin. So this molecule is called pro because it's before. Opio because it's before, it, it's the source of endorphins. So this, this molecule is broken down into three chunks. The opio part is the in source of beta endorphin. The melano part is the source of melanin stimulating hormone, which is why we feel so much better when, on a sunny day. Mm -hmm. And then the cortin is because this same molecule is also broken down into adrenocorticotropic hormone, which regulates cortisol production. So people, when they take uh, opiates, they don't realize that they're playing with the, one of their <laughs> pretty central systems. This is basic stuff that's very handy to 